a valley just like many other valleys. A market just like many other markets. But this is Vietnam, and this market and this valley is that of Dien Bien Phu, where in May 1954, France suffered one of the worst defeats in her history. Certainly one to rank with Waterloo and Sedan and Agincourt. It was a defeat too that had dramatic effects around the world, not least in the West. Today, Dien Bien Phu is at peace, though here and there uniforms still intrude. Every bump in the valley was fortified and fought over most bloodily. The agony of Dien Bien Phu, some called it. Memorials to the dead now crown many of the small hills. Decades later, rusting remnants of the epic struggle are still being dug up. Most of the fortifications in the valley have long since been cleared away, save this, the underground headquarters of the French commander, a macabre monument to such a miserable debacle. For 56 days and 56 nights, the French at Dien Bien Phu were besieged. Hell in a very small place was how one described it. There have, of course, been longer sieges this century. United States troops held Bataan for 66 days, while British and Commonwealth forces held Tobruk for 241 days. But what was different about Dien Bien Phu was that, like Midway and Stalingrad and the First Battle of the Marne, it was one of the most decisive battles this century. And it was the French defeat at Dien Bien Phu that ushered in the United States' involvement in Vietnam with all that that entailed. It will be a war between an elephant and a tiger. If the tiger stands still, the elephant will crush him, but the tiger will never stand still. He will leap upon the elephant's back, ripping out huge chunks of flesh, and then will disappear again into the dark jungle, and slowly the elephant will bleed to death. That will be the war in Indochina. Thus spoke Ho Chi Minh in 1946. His elephant then in Vietnam was the French though his remark was to be just as apt a decade or so later when his opponent was the United States. The West first became interested in Vietnam 300 years ago when French Jesuits established missions there. And it was the persecution of the Vietnamese Catholics by their rulers last century that provided the pretext for France to occupy Indochina. 7,000 miles distant from Paris, Indochina, and Vietnam in particular with its rice and rubber and opium, soon became the jewel of France's empire. Nor did the Vietnamese give the French much trouble. But Hitler's defeat of France in 1940 changed all that. Japan had already occupied much of Vietnam's neighbor to the north, China, and that same year forced the French to allow Japanese troops to enter the country. In July 1941, just five months before Pearl Harbor, Vietnam was integrated into the Japanese military system though French civilians continued to administer it right up until the closing weeks of the war, when, fearing an Allied invasion, the Japanese imprisoned them. This was a body blow to the French, because it not only showed their weakness, and hence encouraged nationalism, but also, with the Japanese defeat in August 1945, created a political vacuum in Vietnam, which Ho Chi Minh's Viet Minh promptly filled. Viet Minh which is a contraction of a longer Vietnamese word meaning League for the Independence of Vietnam, had been founded by Ho in 1941. Now he took advantage of the confusion following the Japanese surrender to declare Vietnam's independence and to establish a government of sorts in the north based on Hanoi. <laughs> 
It was some ten days afterwards that the first British troops arrived in southern Vietnam to disarm the Japanese and to free the French. Though once freed, the French gave the Viet Minh short shrift, especially around Saigon. But Ho was having better luck in the north, where the taking of the Japanese surrender had been left to Chinese troops from across the border. It was largely to get those Chinese to leave that in March 1946, France recognized Ho Chi Minh's regime. More and more French troops poured in as talks dragged on to flesh out that recognition. But before the end of the year, France and the Viet Minh were at war. A war triggered by a relatively minor incident over customs inspection in Hanoi's port of Haiphong. Ho fled to the mountains near the Chinese border, where he remained for the next eight years. Eight years of up and down struggle, as first the French and then the Viet Minh seemed to be gaining the upper hand. Eight years that cost the lives of nearly 100,000 Frenchmen and many times that number of Vietnamese. Time and time again, politicians in Paris with one voice implored their generals to defeat the communists in Indochina for the glory of France, and with another found excuses for not sending them enough troops to win the war. French pride had been deeply wounded by their defeat in 1940, and they were the most reluctant of the imperial powers to grant independence to their colonies. Ho Chi Minh would have been ready for the same friendly association, continuing association between an independent Vietnam and France as India and Pakistan and Ceylon were already establishing with Britain after they had become independent. But the French did not believe that their overseas colonies should become completely independent nations. They thought they should remain a part of what they called the French Union, and that these overseas lands and their peoples were a part of France and the French, overseas France. They would, of course, enjoy a lot of internal self-government in their own affairs, but power would rest with the central government of the Union in Paris, which would control foreign policy and defence policy and certain economic policies and so on. The French wouldn't give way, and so war was inevitable. And a lot of the Vietnamese who had supported the French went over to Ho Chi Minh's side. The French, by and large, were able to maintain their hold on the major towns and, for the most part, to control the roads too. But the country areas were a different matter and were mainly the Viet Minh's province. However hard the French tried, they failed to clear them out. When French troops moved into one country area, the Viet Minh simply faded away to reappear as soon as the French had left, a pattern that became all too familiar to American troops 20 years later. Except on one or two rare occasions when they received a bloody nose that seemed to prove the rightness of their strategy, the Viet Minh avoided set-piece battles which infuriated the French generals. By the spring of 1953, the Viet Minh controlled nearly three-quarters of the country. They invaded French Laos, which set in train yet another political crisis in Paris. This was the period when the French changed their governments as often as others changed their clothes. Public opinion in France had increasingly become war-weary and more and more voices were being raised in favour of a settlement that would bring the boys home. The crisis led to a change of military leadership. General Henri Navarre became the new French commander-in-chief in Indochina. His orders were to save Laos and to prepare the way militarily for eventual negotiation with Ho Chi Minh. The ending of the Korean War that summer meant that Ho could expect even more military aid from the Chinese and Russians than he'd been getting so far. For the French, it became imperative to clip Ho's wings as soon as possible. And this could only be done by tempting the Viet Minh into the open for a set-piece battle where, so the French thought, their superiority in firepower on the ground and in the air would win them the day. The place Navarre chose for his confrontation 
was this lush valley surrounded by high, heavily wooded hills in the northwest corner of Vietnam, a mere eight miles from Laos and 50 from China. But more importantly for the outcome of the battle, it was nearly 200 miles from the main French air base at Hanoi. Dien Bien Phu, the Vietnamese called it, seat of the Border County Administrative Center is the prosaic English translation. Its lushness is due to its high annual rainfall. More than 60 inches fall here during the six months long monsoon season of March to August when clouds cover the valley for most of the day and low level flying, if not out of the question, is extremely uncertain as the French army weather people well knew. Needless to say, it was in the dry season that the French paratroops dropped on Dien Bien Phu. Friday, November the 20th, 1953, to be precise. With two batteries of airborne artillery and a company of heavy mortars, some 1,800 of them fell from the skies that day over the bewildered inhabitants of the valley. They were among the best of the French units in Vietnam and had fought in every major battle here so far. The French had, of course, occupied Dien Bien Phu before, but had been forced out the year previously. At the time, its loss had been dismissed as of no strategic significance, and the valley described as a mere inconsequential hole in the ground. Not all of Navarre's colleagues agreed with his decision to reoccupy Dien Bien Phu, and when the French government heard about it, they sent an admiral from Paris to try to dissuade him. The emissary presented himself in Navarre's office at the very moment the paratroops were dropping on Dien Bien Phu. The drop had nearly been called off at the last minute because of possible bad weather and a late intelligence discovery that the valley was defended by a few hundred Viet Minh regulars armed with mortars and machine guns. Viet Minh mortars and machine guns that caused the casualties among the French and kept the helicopter ambulances busy. By dusk, though, the Viet Minh had been cleared from the valley and time could be spared to bury the dead. Eleven on the French side and nearly a hundred Viet Minh that first day, the forerunners, alas, of some 20,000 who were to be laid to rest at Dien Bien Phu before the battle was over. The French generals were pleased with their first day and felt they could confidently plan for the morrow when another 650 men were to be dropped. The most eagerly awaited event of the second day, though, was the dropping of the bulldozer that was to level the landing strip that had been laid by the French 25 years previously, but lately dug up by the Viet Minh to deter just such an invasion of one of their key opium-growing areas. The Viet Minh, of course, had no aircraft. Raw opium, worth about a million dollars a year, was collected here, and the foreign currency obtained from selling it in Hong Kong and Bangkok had been used to buy medicines and surplus World War II weapons on the black markets there. With the landing strip in order, Planes by the score could now bring to the valley all the ghastly paraphernalia of modern war. Tanks, jeeps, trucks, armoured cars, ambulances, blood banks, workshops, x-ray machines, operating theatres, battery chargers, water purifiers, bridging materials, barbed wire, landmines, signals equipment, mobile electricity generators, you name it, they brought it to Dien Bien Phu. 
including even two field brothels. Some 15,000 men were eventually flown here and more than 60 heavy guns. Two thirds of the garrison were not French at all, but either friendly Vietnamese, Moroccans, Tunisians, Algerians, Senegalese, or else German, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Czech, Polish, and Yugoslav members of the legendary Foreign Legion. This jumble of nationalities, plus the confusion of men living in pup tents and cooking over small open fires, gave the operation, for the first few days at least, the air of a vast Boy Scouts jamboree. Once established, the garrison was encouraged to venture forth to meet the Viet Minh and to gain intelligence of his movements. At first, they encountered merely lightly armed guerrilla bands. But it was not long before there was firm evidence of strong groups of Viet Minh regulars having returned to the area. When, in foraging stabs against them, the garrison came off badly, thereafter they were discouraged from leaving the comparative safety of the valley. So any offensive meaning Dien Bien Phu might have had was gone. And it was merely a question of waiting for the Viet Minh to attack at a moment, presumably, of their own choosing. Meantime, the generals coped with something more to their liking. A veritable deluge of visiting dignitaries come to see this latest wonder of French military ingenuity. That Dien Bien Phu was completely surrounded even by early January, and that the ring was getting tighter every day, didn't deter the generals from their medal pinning. Nor that from the beginning of February, the Viet Minh occasionally pounded the airstrip. Patrols sent to destroy these guns failed even to locate them. What was worse, when a French officer was killed, the Viet Minh found on his body a detailed map of Dien Bien Phu's defences. Sound military sense should have prompted Navarre to evacuate the garrison. His staff did examine the feasibility of a withdrawal under fire, but concluded it would be too costly in men and material, and hence that it was better to sit it out. The gauntlet Navarre had thrown down had indeed been picked up by his Viet Minh opposite number, Vo Nagayan Giap. A history teacher under the French, but now a self-styled general, Giap sent about bringing nearly 100,000 troops to Dien Bien Phu, 40% of his total strength, compared with a mere 4% of the French forces in Indochina the garrison represented. Unlike the French who were parachuted or flown in, the Viet Minh marched to Dien Bien Phu, carrying their weapons and their food with them, and of course, wearing the distinctive palm leaf helmet that was to become familiar to a generation of American troops a decade or so later. Back in the air-conditioned map rooms of the French high command, the Viet Minh were thought to be incapable of keeping supplied, for any length of time, a sizable force so far from their main bases. Even if Giap was able to bring guns to Dien Bien Phu, as soon as they fired, they would be silenced by the heavier French guns on the ground, or by the combat bombers from the air. So ran the impeccable logic of the generals and colonels trained in the military academies of metropolitan France. Although as the crow flew, China was only 50 miles from Dien Bien Phu, the point on the border from which Giap was getting his supplies was some 600 miles away. 600 miles of largely trackless jungle, with many rivers to cross and mountains to scale. Giap got thousands of coolies to work, in the main by forcibly conscripting them without pay from villages along the route. And no doubt, they didn't all work as enthusiastically as this Russian-shot film would have us believe. 
in all, it was a remarkable achievement. And under the very noses of the French, a trail was laid in just three months that wound the 600 miles from the supply depots on the Chinese border. The first Ho Chi Minh Trail, and as history has recorded, not the last. The Viet Minh were masters of camouflage and went to great pains to conceal their movements from the prying gaze of the French reconnaissance planes. At certain points along the trail, the tops of the tall trees were tied together to form a tunnel of vegetation. The Viet Minh knew too that once the monsoon began, flying over Dien Bien Phu and the supply trails leading to it would be difficult. For the French, the whole raison d'etre of Dien Bien Phu was that it could be protected and resupplied from the air without hindrance or interruption. Everything on the Viet Minh side was subordinated to feeding the front. Men, machines and animals were ruthlessly requisitioned. Women played their part too. It was a gigantic, single-minded effort. The Russians gave Giap several hundred heavy trucks, which were put to good use by him, though they were forever conking out, and repairs were not easy in the jungle. By far the greater part of the supplies were taken to Dien Bien Phu by bicycle. Most of them French made and bought years before in the shops of Hanoi and Saigon. Each carried about a fifth of a tonne and some 8,000 tonnes of ammunition and food were brought to Dien Bien Phu in this way. The Viet Minh's biggest achievement, though, and the one which proved crucial to the outcome of the battle, was hauling in more than 200 heavy guns, many of them American, captured by the Chinese in Korea. Bunkers in the hillsides overlooking Dien Bien Phu had been built for the guns, again without the French realising. And when they did, they refused to believe it. Said the French artillery commander, Firstly, the Viet Minh won't succeed in getting their guns here. Secondly, if they do, we'll smash them. Thirdly, even if they manage to keep on firing, they'll be unable to supply their pieces with enough ammunition to do us any real harm. He was to commit suicide shortly after the battle began. Ironically, if the French had evacuated Dien Bien Phu at the last minute, and they clearly had the means to do it before the monsoon began, they might have won a tremendous psychological victory, since it would have left Giap with the bulk of his forces and all his artillery in the middle of nowhere, as it were. While the French, with their greater airborne mobility, could have attacked his supply bases near the Chinese border with relative impunity. But such resource was unknown on the French side by this stage of the Indochina War. Nor was there much unanimity in their approach to the fighting. Navarre's subordinate commander in the north, General René Cogni for one, opposed the stand at Dien Bien Phu, and yet had been entrusted with its detail planning and supplying. The luckless commander there was a dashing, womanizing cavalry colonel by the name of Christian Marie Ferdinand Lacroix de Castries. And it was said that the strong points in the valley were named after his mistresses Anne Marie, Beatrice, Gabrielle, Claudine, Francoise, Isabelle, Dominique, Marcel. But once the battle began, he faded away, and the tactical decisions were taken by his paratroop commander, Pierre Langlais. 
strike only when success is certain was the instruction Giap had from Ho Chi Minh. And by early March, more than a hundred days after the French paratroops had first landed at Dien Bien Phu, Giap decided he was ready. He'd even had a model made of the valley with which to plan his battle and to brief his subordinates. French intelligence got 24 hours warning of the attack when they intercepted a message from Giap's headquarters to clear all civilians from the valley by noon on March the 13th, a Saturday. When told, de Castri guessed the battle would start at 5 p.m., since the Viet Minh usually attacked just before dark when their gunners had enough light to see their targets, but when there wasn't much time for the French combat bombers to intervene, he was dead right. Like a hailstorm on a wintry evening, shells rained down on the hapless Frenchmen. For the first time, they were feeling the full weight of the Viet Minh artillery. Bunker after bunker, trench after trench collapsed, burying under them men and weapons. Many of the French heavy guns were knocked out straight away, and casualties among the gunners in their open pits were high. 500 Frenchmen died that first evening, including some of de Castries' closest colleagues. His chief of staff suffered a nervous breakdown and had to be relieved of his post. One of the key strong points fell almost immediately and was never retaken. Within a few hours, the airstrip was a burning mess of wrecked planes. The control tower and radio beacon both destroyed. And so the premise on which Navarre had based a victorious defense of Dien Bien Phu, namely continued availability of uninterrupted air support, was already being challenged. Many of the non-French members of the garrison deserted or simply gave up the fight. De Castri was to lose a fifth of his force in this way. Curiously, not all of them went over to the enemy. The majority sat it out within the entrenched camp, begging for food from their former comrades or else stealing what they could at night. Equally curiously, de Castri tolerated this bizarre situation. Further strong points fell within the first 72 hours. And by the end of the fifth day, all Dien Bien Phu's outer defences were in Viet Minh hands. The French had also lost a third of their heavy guns. Miraculously, despite the monsoon mists and the deadly accuracy of the Viet Minh attack, some planes were getting in with supplies and reinforcements and were even taking out some of the seriously wounded. But the cost in aircraft was so high that it clearly couldn't last. Mercifully almost, by the end of the first fortnight, the airstrip was totally out of action and the unthinkable had happened. Dien Bien Phu was cut off except for what and who could be parachuted in. Giap now called again on his army of coolies, this time to ring Dien Bien Phu with a vast, intricate web of trenches. Night and day, the valley echoed with the sound of digging on a gigantic scale. The trenches ran to within a hundred yards or so of every French position, and some burrowed beneath them. The defenders asked their headquarters for trench periscopes, but none were available in Vietnam. The request was passed to Paris, but evidently there were not even any suitable relics of the First World War to be had. With ammunition in such short supply, the French had to limit their fire, though they could see the Viet Minh digging. Giap's tactics were to pick off the Dien Bien Phu strong points one at a time. The routine was usually the same. Trenches were dug right up to the particular French outpost and round it more often than not. 
such that supplies and reinforcements couldn't get through and the defence simply died by exhaustion or more likely strangulation. Despite the relentless Viet Minh pressure, the French defence was far from passive. Not a day passed by without a counter-attack or some offensive stab. It was remarkable that their morale held up under such excruciating conditions. Viet Minh prisoners were taken almost every day. At one time, more than 2,000 were held. Mail was dropped to the defenders fairly regularly. One Moroccan sergeant received official permission to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, without, of course, the Paris bureaucrat suggesting how he might leave the valley. Memos and radio messages by the myriad winged their way between Dien Bien Phu and Hanoi or Saigon, where Coney and Navarre were comfortably located. While the defenders sought supplies, and yet more supplies, reinforcements, and yet more reinforcements, which they knew in their hearts would never come in adequate enough numbers or amounts, though hardly a day went by without some supplies were dropped, and some men parachuted into the valley. The generals, on the outside, wrote for history, trying to buck the blame for Dien Bien Phu's predicament, which they knew history would certainly place at their door. As it was, Navarre and Coney were scarcely talking to each other, save what was militarily necessary, which didn't ease things for the unfortunate defenders. Defenders seldom had more than two or three days' ammunition and were constantly having to ration their salvos, while the Viet Minh could be profligate with theirs. Dien Bien Phu was now hardly bigger than a baseball ground. Because of this, and the increasing numbers of the Viet Minh Ak Ak guns, plus, of course, the poor visibility over the valley from the monsoon, more and more of the French supply drops were going astray. What was worse, some of the United States equipment beginning to come France's way, especially the delayed fuse shells, was falling into Viet Minh hands and being used against the defenders with devastating effect. Food was inevitably a problem and usually took second place in the supply drops to ammunition and replacements of men. The defenders were soon on half rations and then on hardly any rations at all. For the French, their replacements never kept pace with their losses, and so the garrison was being steadily reduced in numbers. Those who remained scarcely ever got an opportunity to rest, let alone to recover. The Viet Minh, of course, could be more easily replaced. They simply walked in. But their heavy losses, 10,000 killed in the first month, were affecting their morale. Many of the Viet Minh replacements were only 16 years old and had been recruited a few weeks before. Their training was minimal. Incredibly, some of them deserted to the French lines. Conditions for the wounded on both sides were desperate. Dien Bien Phu had become a valley of tears and death. Pain was everywhere. The Viet Minh were perennially short of medicines, had only one experienced surgeon and half a dozen not too well informed general practitioners. The French were better off with 19 doctors, including some excellent surgeons, but their wounded seldom less than a thousand at any one time and considerably more towards the end, had to face an indefinite stay under fire in dugouts that were several feet underwater. 
The French tried to reach an understanding with Giap regarding the wounded, but he refused to allow any French casualties, even the most serious cases, to leave the valley. Nor would he accept the return by the French of his own wounded. In his Marxist way, he wanted to maximise the effect on French morale of the constant sight of maimed bodies. Every day, hundreds of men suffered at Dien Bien Phu. Every day, many died here. The French soon found it impossible to bury their dead, and the sickly, sweet smell of decomposing corpses pervaded the valley. And then the first time we have, we have not too much bodies, we can take in for a shoot and take in, in the earth alone, one by one. But at the end, it was difficult. and. Uh, Sometimes we cannot recognize in the take the identification because men who have lost their hand and their, their head and no more the dog stakes. So what can you do? No identification. When you saw the uh, dead people and uh, uh, wounded ones on the ground and uh, on a very wet ground with uh, rain and uh, it was a horrid uh, view and uh, perhaps uh, for me as for other people around me it was uh, something uh, making think of the hell it was difficult to change the bandage because we have few bandage it was difficult because we have no bed pan enough. It was difficult because we have no, no sweet things, just little food, not much. And sometimes we have, like it said, we have one ration for not one man, but nine ration for ten men. We take part smaller, but that everybody has something. It was sometimes very hard. In the last days of the, uh, of the struggle, uh, there was a, a big problem of, uh, of flooding. You know? We had uh, uh, water, uh, the, the, uh, the river uh, flooded over, and we had mud uh, uh, up to the, to the belt. You know? uh, so uh, it was very hard to fight in such circumstances. You know? Good Friday, April the 16th, came around and everybody at Dien Bien Phu, or so it seemed, was promoted or decorated. De Castries' insignia of general, together with a congratulatory bottle of champagne, was dropped over the valley, but fell into Viet Minh hands. That mishap symbolized the increasing hopelessness of the French position. Within the week, they had lost more than a half of the airstrip, making further supply drops difficult, if not now, almost impossible. But meanwhile, 6,000 miles away at Geneva in Switzerland, Preparations were being made for a summit conference to decide Indochina's fate. The previous December, Russia, now more moderate since Stalin's death, had suggested that the three Western powers meet with them in Berlin to discuss mutual problems. This had happened within the month, and out of it had come a British suggestion for a further get-together at Geneva in late April to resolve the Korean stalemate and, if possible, Indochina. The United States, under President Eisenhower, and more especially his hardliner anti-communist Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, had been reluctant to agree. The stumbling block was the proposal that the Chinese communists and the Viet Minh should take part. The British never got involved in the war in Vietnam. They didn't give any military aid to the French or to the South Vietnamese. The American attitude was very different indeed. The Americans had been involved 
they were in favor in principle of the Vietnamese being independent, but on condition that they chose an anti-communist and anti-Chinese and anti-Russian national government. And uh, they, of course, were very worried that Ho Chi Minh, uh, if he became the head of the government, uh, and his colleagues would be pro-communist. Uh, and so the Americans had been involved already in the war for some years, not with American soldiers, but they gave enormous financial aid to the French and to the South Vietnamese against Ho Chi Minh. They gave military equipment to the French and uh, to the South Vietnamese. In fact, without that American military aid, material military aid, the French couldn't have carried on the war as long as they did. By the time the Geneva Conference was convening, the United States was contributing almost three quarters of the French cost of the war in Indochina, and had already footed a bill of more than a billion dollars. But as far as most of the world's press was concerned, the main interest at Geneva was seeing the Red Chinese for the first time, led by their Prime Minister, Chuan Lai. The Viet Minh, with their Spartan clothes and serious countenances, came in for much curiosity too. But even as the rest of the delegations were arriving, the French behind the scenes were desperately trying to persuade the United States to deliver a massive airstrike against the Viet Minh at Dien Bien Phu. Dulles appeared willing and, according to the French, even offered atomic bombs. But Eisenhower insisted the operation be cleared with congressional leaders in Washington, who flatly turned it down unless it were a joint action of all the Western allies. But the British, for one, under Winston Churchill, and more especially Anthony Eden, wouldn't do anything that might jeopardize the Geneva negotiations. No doubt the story of Vietnam after 1954, particularly as it affected the United States, would have been different if Dulles had got his way and American planes had successfully destroyed Gap's forces at Dien Bien Phu. With the Geneva Conference underway, the Viet Minh were clearly anxious to defeat the French at Dien Bien Phu as quickly as possible to strengthen their bargaining hand. At 5 p.m. on May the 1st, Giap began his final assault. The Viet Minh dead were countless. The French casualties were heavy too. 500 men in a single evening. Clearly, such losses could not continue. On May the 5th, Hanoi gave to Castri permission to break out, but to have done so in any great numbers would have been pure folly. A few did escape, though, and managed to reach the French lines in Laos. The defenders could see the Viet Minh lining up to attack, but lacked the ammunition to shoot them. By then, they were down to just three hours' supply. On May the 6th, Giap's artillery destroyed most of the remaining French guns. That night, de Castri and his colleagues decided further resistance was pointless. Hanoi pleaded with them not to surrender for the sake of France's pride. The compromise agreed was that the garrison would cease firing at 5.30 p.m. the next day. Dien Bien Phu would fall, not capitulate. Silence came at one stroke. Suddenly, no noise. <laughs> I was sad to be prisoner, but I was happy for my wounded soldiers. When news of the end reached Paris, the French capital went into virtual mourning. All television and radio went off the air to be replaced by solemn music, in particular Berlioz Requiem. In the United States, though, the news didn't rate the front pages. They were filled with another fall that of the communist witch hunter, Senator Joseph McCarthy, who at long last was meeting his match in the televised army hearings. Some 10,000 of the garrison were marched off to prison camps near the Chinese border. Half of them to die en route or in Viet Minh imprisonment, more than were killed by Viet Minh bullets and shells at Dien Bien Phu itself. 
The day after Dien Bien Phu fell was the ninth anniversary of VE Day, the Allied victory over Nazi Germany, traditionally an occasion for the French to demonstrate national unity at the tomb of the unknown soldier in Paris. Many of the politicians who attended were jostled and barracked, save one who was cheered, de Gaulle. The days of France's Fourth Republic were numbered. In Vietnam, General Navarre argued that Dien Bien Phu had given France a new reason for continuing the fighting. But no one believed him anymore, and he was soon to be replaced. Later that same day, just 24 hours after Dien Bien Phu had fallen, the French delegation at Geneva sued for peace in Indochina. France's imperial dream was at an end. It took a further 10 days of pitiless bargaining before the Viet Minh allowed the French to helicopter out their seriously wounded from Dien Bien Phu. Nearly 900 left this way, and their arrival in Hanoi, and subsequently in Paris, was both a joyful and in many ways tragic occasion. It showed the terrible price France's young men had paid for their elders' lessons. 8,000 of the Dien Bien Phu garrison lost their lives, and another 7,000 were wounded in some way. Estimates of the Viet Minh dead vary between 12 and 25,000. The war in Indochina officially ended on July the 20th, 1954. Laos and Cambodia were given their independence by the French, as was Vietnam. But the northern part of the country, above the 17th parallel, was handed to the Viet Minh. It was written into the Geneva Agreement that within two years, a referendum was to be held in the whole of Vietnam to decide on reunification. But how that count was never taken is another story. All that remained now was for the French administrators in Hanoi to hand over to the Viet Minh and to make their withdrawal while Ho Chi Minh and his victorious troops prepared to enter their new capital. One Vietnam War was over. Another, alas, was about to begin. Thank you.